like to welcome everyone to this webinar. Um, today we're going to be talking about Onshape Render Studio, an exciting new thing that we've just announced. Um, it's going to bring photorealistic rendering um, to everybody inside the using the, the Onshape platform. Uh, my name is Greg Brown. I'm head of product management here at Onshape, and I'm joined today by Jay Tedeschi. And so thank you for taking this time and hope you'll enjoy the next hour or so. So the agenda today is uh, it's pretty simple here. I'll tell you about what is Render Studio. Uh, we're going to take a pretty in-depth look through it and actually think about and have a look about some of the technology that's behind it. Um, Jay's also going to talk about how you can use Render Studio in different kind of use cases. It's a pretty interesting um, take on this as well. And finally, we're going to wrap up with some tips and tricks and probably some little demonstrations. And finally, a, an image review and critique session, which I'm, which I'm kind of looking forward to as well. So let's get started. And what is Render Studio? Well, I think, as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words here. Render Studio allows you to create images such as like this from within the Onshape platform. I think that's pretty exciting as it is. It doesn't need any words, titles, or bullets, um, bullet points to, to make this. Um, and we're going to be seeing a lot of great imagery like this throughout the rest of the next hour. To be a little bit more specific, this is a before shot. This is what you would be used to seeing right now inside Onshape. And with Render Studio, still inside Onshape, you're going to be able to look at images like this. This is the same design, the same data set that you've been working on, the same surfaces and curves and, and, and features, but rendered in a hyper-realistic, photo-like way uh, in real time. Um, I think that that, again, speaks for itself. Now, what are some of the benefits to using Onshape Render Studio? I mean, there's a really, there's a few different ways you can use it, and there's a lot of benefits you can get from it. For example, you can accelerate your design process. Um, designers and engineers can visualize design changes immediately and very, very accurately with this photorealistic, physically accurate um, rendering that we're doing here. And we can do this from with the inside on shape without the need to export out any data to start in a third party external application. You can do this all within on shape. So as you make changes to a surface, you want to see how that is changing the reflection, do that within Onshape. Taken a bit further, you can expedite your new product introduction because um, users can create hyper-realistic and market-ready imagery uh, without wasting time or having to spend a lot of money on creating traditional prototypes and setting up photo shoots for that sort of thing. Thirdly, having images like this, again, I'll say it, picture's worth a thousand words, it improves collaboration. You can share your design concepts with critical internal and, and external, uh, say, customers or investor stakeholders uh, using these compelling photo-like images. And really, really importantly, and probably one of the keys to everything we're talking about today and why it's so interesting for Onshape is that you can lower your capital expenses because Render Studio is running as a cloud-native service. It does not require any new, expensive, or hard to obtain these days uh, GPUs. It runs on any desktop web browser that currently supports Onshape. That means all these fantastic images you see today will be able to be done on Chromebooks, MacBooks, Windows, Linux laptops, whatever you like, whatever supports Onshape today. The heavy lifting, the hard computation is being done in the cloud. So I'm going to kick it over now to Jay, um, who is going to uh, to take us through a look um, what's behind and what's inside this technology. Thanks, Jay. Greg. Uh, we're going to start off today uh, by taking a look at just a basic workflow to uh, help familiarize you with uh, essentially how Render Studio functions uh, and creates these amazing images from your Onshape designs. Go ahead, Greg. All right, I will get that. All right, there you go. All right, thank you. So I'm gonna start off here in Onshape itself. We have a wheel assembly as part of a uh, aircraft landing gear. We're gonna create a scene based on one of my assemblies. So I'll go to the assembly. 
I'll come down to the wheel tire assembly and I'll select, a con I, I'm using a configuration here uh, just to start off to isolate those models, those components in the assembly that I want to uh, essentially add materials to and start getting a feel for what the rendering is gonna look like. So I selected the tessellation quality uh, and now we'll come in and actually, first thing I'm gonna do is save, just give it a name, I'm gonna call it uh, render one. Let's go ahead and save that. All right, now, first things first, now that we've got this thing saved, let's just take a look at the materials themselves as they came in from Onshape. So regardless of the fact that there's a very extensive uh, material library, we can modify the materials that are in there themselves, as well as modifying materials that come in from Onshape. So what I'm gonna do is apply an environment to get some accurate environmental lighting here in the scene. Uh, this one has a couple of point light sources. Uh, and that, with that done, let's go ahead and zoom in here on the wheel. And I'm going to start modifying the settings for this material. Now, this is not one of the iRay uh, V materials. This is just the material appearance as it came in from Onshape itself. And with a few tweaks, uh, I'm able to very quickly get it to a photorealistic state. Uh, modifying the reflection parameters, modifying the roughness of the, of the, the in this case, it's a powder coat, but modifying that itself just to get it so that it, that looks fairly real. Next up is the, uh, the brake housing itself. Now that's made of stainless steel. So let's down here in the appearances library, let's type in stain and there's stainless steel. So I can right click on the material and assign it to the component, which is selected in the render studio window. As you'll see, I'm, I'm making extensive use of the library search facility. Uh, let's look for gunmetal. That's a, a really good material with a lot of a uh, lot of modification capabilities. It's one of the provided materials through the V through the IRA V materials. I drag it, drop it on the component, and it updates the component appearance in the render window. Now let's do a search for bare metal. Now this is a uh, this is something that I've used before, so I know this material exists. So I'm, I'm gonna go through and show you guys. You, know, it, it, you don't have to know the names of these materials. You can, you can see the bare metal right there, but you can go through the material library and, and scroll to your heart's delight. But as there are pretty much thousands and thousands of these materials, you'll get a feel for the ones that work best for you over time. And the quickest way to use the product once you've gotten to that point is by far uh, using the search as I'm doing right here. Uh, let's go ahead and look for a rubber. So not flooring, there it is, rubber black. Let's drag it, drop it, assign it to the part. And now I'm going to modify some of the settings for that material to get it look more like a rubber that you would find on, uh, on a tire. Now, keep in mind that these, once you modify these settings, you can save these off as a user customized material. So you're not, you're not required to use just the materials in the library. You can, you can pretty much use those materials as a source, modify them to your liking, and then save them uh, to a personal, as a personal material. So now you can see we've got the, the, the powder coating on the wheel, the rubber, uh, pretty much all of the appearances that we want on this uh, wheel and tire assembly are saved. So let's go ahead and save this and then move on to the, uh, the next slide, which is uh, where we're gonna discuss uh, design updates. It's a fact of life that designs change over time. So you've put in all this work, uh, you know, granted that was just a few minutes, uh, condensed uh, rendering setup, but you know, I, I want to leverage those changes. I don't want to have to redo everything every time I make a change to my design. So if we move to the to let me show you now how we go about performing these updates. So I'm going to go back to Onshape. We're in the uh, assembly environment. I'm going to go to a uh, configuration I'm using just to save time, where I've done some replicate arrays of all of my fasteners. So now we're gonna go back into Render Studio and we're going to update the existing scene. So we're gonna leverage all of the changes that we've made. We're not gonna, all of those will be preserved. 
All we're gonna do is go to a different configuration and then update the scene with all the new models, all the new components, in this case being the fasteners, which were added to the scene. So it takes a few moments, prepares the model, and then dumps us back into the Render Studio uh, UI. So as you can see, all the fasteners that I just added out in the assembly environment are now in the render environment. I'm going to show you a couple of neat little techniques over here with filtering uh, in the scene graph. Now, first things first, I'll just select all of the screws. And you'll notice that because, uh, because Render Studio supports instancing, even though I selected just one, it recognizes that all of those fasteners are the same fastener. They're just instances of the same component. So I only have to select one, apply a material to it, in this case, bare metal again. So you guys can probably see it's my favorite. Um, now we're going to use filtering over in the scene graph. I'll put in the first three numbers for the prefix for the castle bolt itself. I'm sorry, the castle nut. And it isolates all of the castle nuts in the assembly. Again, I can isolate that and then apply the bare material to it. We're going to use the scene graph one more time. I'll type in hex, which should show us all of the hex fasteners. Again, because of instancing, I can select just a single one. I'll apply the material to it. And that's it, looks fantastic. Now you'll notice like when I'm, one thing I wanna drive home really quickly was how quickly this thing gets to a photorealistic state. Uh, and I'm gonna discuss the, the what's under the hood here, what is enabling that? What's enabling you to, to see the results of the rendering uh, in almost real time? You know, keep in mind that previously rendering tools required uh, not only, as Greg pointed out, did they require large horsepower machines with like graphics cards that had gobs of video RAM. Uh, they also basically, you, you added these materials, but you couldn't see what the rendering was going to look like until you actually performed a rendering, which, you know, based on the capabilities your machine could take anywhere from 10 minutes to 10 hours. Um, in this case, this is what makes Render Studio different. It is NVIDIA iRay. So Render Studio is driven, as we point out, by iRay. So we're gonna take a look now at what's actually under the hood. Uh, NVIDIA iRay, which unlike rendering engines, which preceded it, it's physics, it, I'm sorry, is physics based. That being, it generates photorealistic images through the simulation of the physical behavior of light materials. It also has the ability to utilize high dynamic range images, which are referred to HDR images, uh, it uses those images as environments. Now, those environments can provide either a light source, the background imagery, or both. Uh, you saw me in the first example uh, when I, I applied that environment, even though we didn't see any scenery behind it, I was using the environment to grab the lights, uh, the light sources themselves and the color of the sky and those were all applied as a light source to the model, and that's what was allowing me to evaluate the reflection of the powder coating on the wheel when I was tweaking the material. Um, iRay is RTX GPU powered and uses NVIDIA's optics ray tracing engine. Uh, its implementation in Render Studio, like Onshape itself, is cloud enabled. Uh, and, and that means to you that it provides you with almost real time feedback when creating and editing scenes, as well as manipulating materials and lights. Uh, it also features, I, I'm not sure, you probably noticed that uh, every time I moved the display or, or did something, it, the image initially would come up real rough and dithered. Uh, that, what's going on there is, uh, is referred to as a denoiser. Uh, NVIDIA's uh, denoiser is actually developed using uh, deep learning techniques, and, and those were used to evaluate tens of thousands of rendered images, and the results of that are used in the denoiser to evaluate with you know, bright pixels or bright spots, and then it averages those things out. So very, very quickly, you know, almost instantaneously, you're, you're getting feedback on the results of changes to the light in the environment, changes to material properties, um, pretty much you know, everything that you see on the screen is a result of what you're seeing here on this first slide. So RTX GPU powered, as well as the utilization of uh, denoising. Go to the next slide, Greg. Um, as it pertains to the material libraries themselves, uh, NVIDIA's material definition language is used to create uh, what 
it, it's a rather extensive library. You saw me browsing through it for a little a little bit, uh, and it's it's easy to see why. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I just saw my camera's off. Sorry about that. Um, it's easy to see why I utilize search so much uh, when I'm using the product because you, you'd end up spending minutes and minutes and minutes of browsing through those materials just to find one, uh, as opposed to, like I said, you know, ultimately you will, you'll, you'll find the ones that you use most often. Like I use bare metal a lot for fasteners because it looks just fantastic. Um, suffice it to say, you're never going to be at a loss for materials. Uh, Render Studio also allows you to utilize photometric lights. Uh, that capability is in there. So companies that are doing lighting design, uh, you can use uh, industry standard IES profiles uh, for the lights themselves. And I'm, I'm actually going to show you an example of that a little later on. Uh, it also utilizes uh, fully realistic camera settings and effects. So uh, aperture settings, aperture blade number, uh, lens settings, so f-stops and ISO film speeds, focal lengths, it's all in there. And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that in, in a moment. Sorry about that. Didn't know my camera was off. No, we're back. <laughs> oh, and I'm not in my garage. This is actually my office. <laughs> okay. I was asked that. All right, so now we're going to take a look at rendering as a design tool. So, Greg? Thank you. So this is a, uh, a, obviously it's an interior of a living room. And we're gonna take a look at some examples of what, for example, a lighting designer could do. So first thing I'm gonna do is search over in the scene graph and I'm gonna select bulb. And now we're gonna add an emissive material to the bulb in those floor towers. So we'll come over here to the appearance tab and we're gonna set our intensity of the light as well as the color of the light. I'm gonna give it a nice little yellow, yellowish amber shade. We'll set the unit for emission to lumens and we'll set our unit scale to a thousand because uh, it, it by default is doing its calculations in meters and I designed everything in millimeters. So we'll just bump that up by a thousand. And now you, very quickly, you can see the effect of the lights uh, within the scene. Again, as I pointed out, this is all happening in real time, and you can see the denoiser uh, in effect as well. So with the floor lights done, let's, uh, let's actually come over here into the scene graph and let's select the, uh, the overhead recessed bulbs. So for these, we're actually gonna use those IES profiles that I talked about. So let's go ahead and grab that. We're gonna apply that as our material for the bulbs themselves. So now over here, I'm gonna set the intensity, this zero to 100, I'm gonna set like a 50% dimmer. We'll set our unit scale to 1000 again, just as, as we did before. And now I'm gonna browse into a library of IES lamps. So let's grab and download this uh, Biga. Uh, it's a 884 lumen, 10 watt bulb. So that's kind of a flood. Uh, and now let's search for a spot and I've got a Cooper lighting one in my, there it is. So let's scroll down and I'm gonna grab that spotlight. It's got really nice pronounced uh, spot essentially on the floor. I'm gonna download that as well. And these files end up being, I saved them in a folder on my machine that I call uh, light profiles. So now let's go ahead and load those profiles and see the effect of it. So we'll do that Cooper spot first. And it takes a moment to uh, to actually apply the the settings for the lamp itself, and now you can see the spots from the lamp on the floor. Now this is this, this is just it, it's it shows the usefulness of this tool when doing design. So if you were a lighting manufacturer, for example, you could actually see the effect of uh, changes of different bulbs and different reflector housings in different environments, uh, and it's it's quite profound. So let's go back to a different view. In this case, we'll go back to our first camera view, which is at the other end of the living room. And now let's use that flood. Love this floodlight. So there's the Bega flood. It's amazing how much light 10 watts of LED can put in a scene. Absolutely incredible. 
So that's essentially it with regards to uh, it, the usefulness of, of the IES, the photometric lights, um, and uh, you know how you can basically utilize uh, Render Studio not just for creating marketing assets, but also as a design tool itself. Okay, Greg. Okay, final section. Let's take a look at some marketing asset creation. All right, uh, marketing assets would be images that we would see in catalogs, online catalogs. I don't know, does anyone do paper catalogs anymore? I, I'm not <laughs> sure. Anyway, uh, so what we're looking at here is the, that coffee table from that previous uh, living room model that I had. And you can see that you know we've got reflections of the overhead lights in the glass top of the table. You can see the fabric of the of the sofa, the sectional itself. Uh, we can see everything very clearly. Now the problem with this is that we can see everything very clearly. And <laughs> if I'm a marketing person and I'm trying to sell the coffee table, I want to draw your attention to the coffee table. So a technique that photographers, if I got this thing in the studio. And a technique that photographers would use would be to use a, sh a more shallow depth of field to isolate uh, and draw your attention to the coffee table. So, uh, Greg, go ahead and. So here is uh, this is some of the lens settings that I was talking about previously, and you'll see that I have uh, aperture blades for this lens set to 16 <laughs> blades, and I've got my f-stop aperture setting is set to 5.6. So if you look at the couch, the fabric on the couch in the foreground, you can see that's a little bit blurred. The the chair on the other side of the room, that's a little bit blurred. The, the other end of the sectional is blurred. And the, the coffee table is still nice and crisp. We can actually go to an extreme, if you hit it again, Greg. So now we'll go to a 2.8 aperture, um, which is letting in even more light and blurring out more and more our foreground and background and that that does that achieves what i want as a marketing person which is to draw the user or draw the viewer's attention to the coffee table itself and go ahead greg and hit it and we'll look at the final rendered image and that is just you know that's photorealistic i mean you'd have a hard time you'd have a hard time discerning whether or not that is real or a photograph yeah, there's I mean there's so much to look at in this shot. Um, whether it's the you know the transmission of the light through the glass onto the carpet underneath it, um, yeah, throwing those. Look at the grain the, in the wood. Oh yeah, yeah, the wood grain in the front front right corner. Um, nice. Remember, none of that bumpiness is modelled in the actual CAD. Um, that's all Good coming point. from uh, from the material and the texture and the bump map, and it it it's smart enough to need to pick up the lights. Right. And, Yep. So now let's let's change gears just a little bit here, and we're going to talk um, a little bit about some of the tips and tricks that you can use to to create these kinds of of compelling images. Um, it's a big field, and it's not kind of expected that everybody can just immediately pick this up and create a studio quality um, marketing imagery. Um, and it's not necessarily to do that, but it's very, very easy to get to that 80, 90 percent, and then that final 10, 20 percent is also possible as well with some with some tips and tricks. So the first thing that I want to talk about is kind of a philosophical, more theme around it, and that's to achieve reality through imperfection. Um, as you probably know, you know, real world images um, are only compelling if they contain imperfections. I mean, it's the same if people's faces are perfectly symmetric in like some of the early Hollywood animation movies, um, when things were too symmetric, they just aren't convincing. There's imperfections in everything from symmetry through to uh, especially the materials and the lighting. So that's going to be a recurring theme through when we start looking at some of these uh, images in a, in a few moments here, um, that imperfection is actually going to get you to where you need to be. The next big theme um, is to think like a photographer. After all, as, as Jay said, and he used a lot of photographic references in here, uh, in fact, um, this is all about creating photos. <laughs> um, and so to do that, uh, it's best to think like a photographer. You need to think about composition. You need to think especially 
about light. Uh, as it says here, it's nearly all about the light. And after all, photography means light writing. So you're writing the scene, painting the scene with light. And that's why Jay spent so much time going into, uh, into those light models, the IES models, um, the emissive models, and how materials react to it. Uh, and again, as Jay said, the IRA technology is all about creating uh, physical, um, physically accurate results um, of how and modeling how the light will actually interact with materials. Another trick, uh, and Jay, if we pretty much use this as a matter of course now, but we do want to share this uh, information with you. We, both of us and, and probably many of you on the call will, will understand this from many, many years of using tools like this, that depth of field and other realistic lens controls are a key to compelling results. Um, if everything is too clear, your eye doesn't know where to look. Right? You need to draw people's eye to the part of the scene uh, where you want them to look whether it's a particular part in an assembly um, or a particular product in the environment. Um, it's all about drawing people's eye to it. And there's other things, again, thinking like a photographer, compositional themes, the rule of thirds you may have heard of, yeah. how to set out the scene. Um, it's kind of a natural thing that we do after using this for a long, long time. But um, when it kickstarts you, we're going to bootstrap you with these, with these uh, insider secrets here. The, the other one, um, is to think hard about what you model versus what you don't model. Um, so Jay's yeah, used both one. techniques. Yeah, yeah, he's used subtly, has used both techniques already. Um, the environment that he applied for many of these things contains the light sources for the most part. But that doesn't have to be it. You can create your additional light sources, like those down lights or the, the table lamp and the, you know, those things. You can even create materials and objects that are just outside of the scene and put a mirror finish on it or a very nice white, like a, a bone porcelain type of material on it. And that will act as a reflector, just as yep. a photographer would do that anytime they yep. set up a portrait, you know, to get, do what they do. So that's, I, I could go on all day about that, but but I really want people straight after this call to start producing compelling images, sharing them on social media and showing how good exactly. Onshape's um, render studio is. So I want to give you these tips here. Um, of course, by default, perspective view will always be on. Uh, it's very, very few times in reality where orthographic images are appropriate. <laughs> um, so rather than using just switching to orthographic, what you should do is control the lens. You can change the focal length of the lens, which will provide that flattening or fisheye or anything in between uh, that you wanted to. Anyway, Alec, probably enough. The, yeah, I was, I was going to say, uh, like with regards to the lighting, and you were saying like thinking outside the box with regards to, you know, environment lighting itself. And one, a little trick that I've used a lot uh, is when the environment itself is not lighting what I want the user to look at. I will sometimes just create like a little sphere and hang it just outside of the range of the camera so you can't see the sphere and then apply a, an emissive material to it. So oh. I've, essentially I've created like a, you know, somebody standing there with a spotlight shining the light on what I want them to look at. That's a trick, that's, that's a good trick. Yeah, don't be afraid to, uh, to decide on modeling extra things. And also take stuff away that you really don't need. That's another trick here to make your life oh, easier. Yep. Yeah, you're going to say something there, Jay? Yeah, I was going to say that's exactly it. Yeah, yeah. just just you. I know it's like not a traditional use of configurations in Onshape, but you know I've started using configurations called Render, or you know, and this configuration is just for me to render. So I've turned off everything that's I, that's not of interest that I don't want in the scene. Um, so, and I use those to drive the the, 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 the rendering yeah. images yeah. themselves. Yeah, there's a few different ways you can do that. Mm -hmm. And actually one very, very good way is to create a separate assembly for your rendering. Um, yep. As opposed to anything that's, uh, you know, that sort of works in parallel with the, the in-progress stuff. All right, this other theme here, um, before we show you something, is, is to take care of the environment. <laughs> I mean that in a kind of pun, but also seriously here. The environment, that you put around the image, uh, as I said, contains a lot of information about the lighting uh, and perhaps background imagery. 
Now, this is an area where people might run into trouble initially because sometimes it's very difficult to match an environment with the, the object that's in the scene. Um, so there are ways, and I'll show you a few of them, how to address that. Uh, so never just accept the defaults. There's always something that you can tune, uh, tune up for this um, to take care of the environment. Now, part of the environment, again, is, is materials and the huge materials libraries um, that are part of the Render Studio. So there's a couple that Jay pointed out. Um, one of them's called V Materials, and the other one is called V Materials 2. And they contain different materials and lots of and lots of really cool ones, which I'll show you a couple more of my favorites. Uh, Jay's Bare Metal is, is one of them, but I've got some different ones. Um, the, the, the last one on this list here is what, again, comes to being smart about what you model versus what you don't model. Now, there's some things that are going to be new to CAD designers and engineers who perhaps haven't dipped their toes into the world of rendering before. Uh, but one of them is that, you know, you can play a lot of tricks with the material, especially bumpiness and other features. Um, there's a really, really nice thing inside of V Materials 2 libraries. Uh, many of the materials contain a checkbox which says, put a rounded edge on all sharp edges. So, Put a rounded fillet on all sharp edges and so you don't have to take time to round everything out you just let the material do it for you and you won't you, you'll be extremely impressed and surprised how much more realism that that round edge gives um, in conjunction with some you know imperfections uh, that you put in in the material so while we're um in this mode of kind of riffing in between uh, tips and tricks. I've got here a, uh, an assembly, and I believe some of the Ghost Raptor BattleBot team are on this call. I just saw a name pop up. Um, so welcome, thank you for joining. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining, by the way. Uh, here, here's an assembly, here's the assembly of their uh, Ghost Raptor BattleBot here in, um, in the assembly view. So I'll just put it in a, a nicely predetermined view. And, I kind of already gave it away, but here's the here's the view inside um, uh, Render Studio, and you'll see how quickly things are updating. Um, I'm I'm literally, you know, here's the mouse in my hand. I'm running this uh, live as we speak. Um, the interesting thing on this model is, you know, there's some nice materials that have got some beaten up textures on them. Um, there's some nice unblemished stuff over here as well. All the bolts have got a nice nickel finish. And here I've used a lot of, um, of decals, 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 whatever you choose to call them. Um, and here, you know, I've got a camera angle showing some of the sponsors of this, uh, this Ghost Raptor team, including Onshape, of course. Um, and if I go to this slightly other modified camera of this, which includes the depth of field, you'll see as it resolves and the denoising so takes awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it really pops out, um, firstly, the sponsor's logos, but it, it really pops out where you want the eye to draw to. Um, so there's some, there's some nice tips there. I mean, I like to use named views because, you know, they're associated to the, the original Onshape views, um, but also they contain information about the camera. Um, so you can see here that my first view, the RS Reality um, uh, Render Studio view, didn't contain any depth of field. In fact, I can um, I can reveal some of the tree here and show you where to look in if you start using uh, Render Studio. If I select up here on the options, there's a lot of options available to you. Now these are the things that control the renderer, the renderer, and the environment itself. Um, and I'm not going to explain all of these in any detail. There's a few favorites, and I'll show you on a different one that, that has an environment map in it. Um, maybe a particularly interesting thing is, uh, is some of the controls you ho have over the denoiser here. Um, you can turn it off. Uh, you can add a bloom filter. Uh, so if you have point sources of light, you can actually create this kind of slightly foggy bloom around it, um, which is very, very uh, compelling and, and realistic. A lot of stuff down here, you can add um, motion blur, 
Um, the other caustic sampler is what you would use if you've got very complicated paths of light, say going through a, a glass or crystal containing a liquid, um, a glass of water basically, that's what I meant, <laughs> um, or lenses and things like that where the light paths are bouncing around uh, very, very com in a complicated way. This caustic sampler is something that you might want to consider turning on. So I only bring you here to show you a, a little bit of um, where you guys can, can go and look afterwards. Um, again, this, this tip here is that you can maximize the mode to, to maximize the, uh, the impact, <laughs> um, so to speak. The, the other one I want to have a look at is, is over here. Now, this is a pretty cool scene. Um, I don't know if I, if I get rid of this a little bit. Okay, so I've got a camera here modeled and I've got a very nice environment in the background. Um, I've actually used a very high resolution, in fact, an 8K resolution background uh, HDR file, for those of you wondering. Um, so it gives a really, really nice transition between what is modeled and what is actually in, in the background. Um, so again, I'm going to just go to that environment and point out a couple of things. You can actually change the way that environment is being mapped. Uh, you can change it to different sorts of mappings, um, infinite mappings, you know, environments that have ground as part of them or spheres. And also can change um, some values here to sort of change the, the perspective or the, the amount of spherical kind of warping that's going on. Um, that, you know, so if the environment is looking a little bit wonky, it's probably because you need to come in here and, and fit it to your scene. So obviously the thing that's of real interest in this scene is the reflection. Now these reflections that's happening in this lens is actually coming from this 8K environment file, which you can imagine is this big sort of spherical mapped thing around the environment. So I'm looking at the sunset in the clouds. And if you look closely, this is a really, really impressive ray trace through multiple lenses that are in part of this big camera lens. I'll just point out a few things here. Oh, by the way, the paint that's on the lens is a really nice because it has this this onion, um, this orange peel. Orange peel. Orange peel, not onion peel or something else, but orange peel is this. And I can, can change, and that's that, that bumpiness, uh, which is, again, if I look at the lens, which is in my cupboard, um, it's pretty realistic to this. Now, if I click on and select that lens at the front, um, I can have a look at the appearance that I've applied to it. So I've applied something called automotive glass, which is a pretty generic glass at this moment. Uh, but there's lots more where that came from. I'm going to move to look at one of the glasses that's in the V Materials Library. And you can see down here, there's a lot. Right? So there's one that's this um, fluorine crown glass, or FK it's usually called in the, in the industry. Um, and I assign that to that part. And it's going to re-render the scene. And this one takes a little bit extra because if you have a look over here, there are unbelievable amount of controls for it. I mean, we're talking about controlling um, things you've probably never heard of, but you might need to Google, um, especially in the area of the coating. Now, maybe I'm going to apply a slightly interesting coating because I want to use this at uh, in certain wavelengths. So I can you know, put a coating, give it a very, a, an interesting value. And now I've kind of got that sunglass uh, effect on the front of it. Um, we're gonna talk about fritting, which is kind of glass welding or how pieces of glass, how the light would react if it's going through multiple welded pieces of glass. Dirt, how much dirt do I want to put on a lens? How much smudging do I want to put? All these things are an incredible amount of these imperfections that I talk about before. Um, to go to making a compelling, a compelling image. Now, if I go to a different camera angle, that's a camera, but no, if I go to a different camera angle, say the back of the uh, the back of the camera here. So the whole world has switched, right? You know, the I, I've I've rotated the entire world here. So this is this is what we had our back to before. And I have an interesting material that I've got on here. I didn't obviously model this in on shape. I just modeled it as a flat piece of geometry. And then if I select just that one, you'll see that the, the material on it is an interesting sounding one called display screen. 
So this is pre-built for you by NVIDIA in part of the MDL or one of those libraries, I can't remember which one, where I can set up to load a different image and perhaps I'm going to load an image that I snapshotted earlier and I'm going to bring that and replace the image and effectively take a photograph or just simulate taking a photograph <laughs> of, of what's in there. So, I mean, that's it's slightly um, uh, fun here. Maybe you're not going to be doing too much of this. But what I really wanted to indicate here was we're talking about the real deal. This is the powerful rendering stuff. Um, you know, we could stand this up against any uh, any photo rendering, uh, physics-based rendering um, tools that are out there. And now we make it available um, not only just inside Onshape, but as a cloud service. Um, I could be running this, uh, you don't even probably know what sort of computer, it doesn't matter. I could be running this on a Chromebook or my MacBook, or then um, not have to worry about bringing that big one home from work, um, because I haven't been to work for about 18 months. Um, I'm running on my home, um, my home computer here. So I can just flip that back, go back to my screen, go back and forward, <laughs> and um, and have that as the uh, back at that scene there. Just now nuts. all these images you're looking at here are the real-time uh, rendered ones, and you see it's taking a couple of seconds tops. Um, if I wanted to, I could export these out uh, for a produ production image at a very very high quality, and I can ask it to to converge on and more and more quality but for for screen usage like this um i think we're not um uh you know i think you can see that why we are very very impressed with this with this capability i love that reflection it's uh it's, it's my favorite, amazing my favorite thing so while that is fun uh let's just finish up here with some a bit of a rapid fire image critique um it's kind of like i don't know it's a game show now. This is an image that Jay did, which everybody is blew everybody's socks off, right? Why? Because Jay, what's your favorite part of this image? <laughs> uh, the gel coat material and yep. depth of field. The gel okay. coat's just incredible. Uh, we have other images that I did of the same mm -hmm. model, with that same high resolution environment. Um, Oh, that, that's another one. The, the, you know, make sure that the, the environments that are supplied with Render Studio are high resolution, but you can go online to a source like Polyhaven or something like that, and they have those same, they're like open source uh, images, that are royalty free, and uh, you can find the same environments in a much higher resolution. Now, be forewarned, uh, the reason we don't demo with them here is because they take a long time to load, but the upside is you can get just absolutely stunning uh, images like this. Um, hey, Jay, a question was how long it took you to render that image? How long do you think? That like, sailplane? Like, yeah. That was, that literally rendered in about two and a half minutes. Yeah. I meant setup, I think. They wanted from start oh, to finish. Yeah. Setup? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I've been modeling that thing for a while. You know, I probably had about a, a you know, three or four hours of modeling time to model the thing. Uh, but as far as set, setting it up for render, you know, less than 30 minutes, 35 minutes. Yeah, I mean, there's only a couple of materials on that. Yeah. And, it's, you know, the, there's the, the clear stuff, the, the acrylic or, uh, and the, the, or the um, polycarb, the, the gel coat, and then the environment. The environment is key there. And, yeah. And, but the act, and then once you get that set up, boom, you know, the renderings are fast. This one is this one is really really good and I mean it, it's subtle but it, real images and compelling images have a lot of subtleties in them that only reveal themselves after a while and, and this one is check out the reflection in the top third of the image you know it's reflecting where this part of the mechanism is and you can see over here a bit further on the nacelle of the engine it's reflecting the fuselage of the plane um, these things you know, this is where ray tracing and physics, physically correct rendering really, uh, really shines. Um, yeah, this, this one's is, amazing. Yeah, yeah. This is the one I have that little trick with the the sphere of light that's just above, uh, providing some li additional lighting on the gear itself. Um, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. We'll just rip through some of these because we've got a few questions coming. But this one is actually using one of those 8K 
um, very high resolution environments that Jay talked about. I got it off Polyhaven, uh, as he said, and you know, it works. It works like this really well. This is actually saved out rather than a screenshot, so it's a little, um, a little bit better. Here's a technique I like to use uh, for a more of a product shot. You can highlight things not only using depth of field, which obviously this is using pretty extensively, um, but by applying a kind of a matte finish architectural material, it's called in here, uh, and then just highlighting one part, or the one part that you're trying to sell to somebody. Um, I use this technique quite often. Again, here is another one where I've made all of the dirt bike out of that architectural material, and then the pipe itself is using a really cool material which is called pitted steel, uh, which has built-in ability to add um, heat treatment or heat um, discoloration as well as some corrosion on it. This one just blows my mind. Yeah, this I mean this could be a photograph. Um, <laughs> this nuts. is a really great example of not just great material selection and you know you can see some smudging and some fingerprint kind of stuff on especially on this area um, but it really blends into the environment really really well so this is where uh, Neil um, who actually did this Neil Cook um, has taken care of the environment <laughs> playing around with some uh, some a chassis of a, a Formula SAE car here I was fiddling around with um, maybe the I, I did leave it out in the, the rain a little bit too much and I did corrode it a little bit too much. Um, interesting here with this, I'm looking down the, the, the chassis and this grill at the front is not actually modeled. It's actually a flat surface uh, in, in on shape, but I applied a grid to it. Um, and that's one of these materials, again, that Jay talked about, that you, you can use the material modeling versus, versus the geometry modeling approach. And, Way and faster. by doing that, I, I saved, I don't know, thousands and thousands of, or hundreds of thousands of, of uh, possible tessellation. Um, facets. Facets in there, yes. Oh Which God. one's pretty sweet? This one's pretty sweet. Again, if you have a look, there's some Stand scratches. <laughs> <laughs> there's some scratches on nuts. here. Um, somebody, you know, brushed up against it. Um, it makes it much more compelling. Um, again, with a little bit of depth of field. Um, I've used it's a pretty fabric on the seat. Yeah, again, that's that's material <laughs> texture. It's not actually geometrically modelled like that. Okay, this is my Fast and Furious um, uh, addiction. <laughs> so I've got neon underglow under the car. Um, I've got some interior lights using Jay's technique of having a hidden sphere. It's actually a, it's hidden, but you'll see it in a second. Uh, and when I peel off the top, you can actually, well, actually not a sphere, it's a disc in this case, uh, modeling the dome light. Um, so lighting effects. This one has another light, so a little light for the number plate. And, and extreme depth of field. So sometimes you can create a kind of an artistic effect by really, really overdoing the, the depth of field. Um, but the environment, which is one of these environments that's kind of like an underpass with graffiti filled walls, um, provides really, really good um, scene to it. Here's some more uh, use of lighting and I've actually modeled these lights and then applied emissive material, emissive light properties to them. And you can kind of see it's backlighting it. Um, so again, you think like a photographer, you can actually model the setups that you would see in a studio, the overhead, you know, a hair light, change the color on it a little bit. Um, there's a little bit of light throwing up from the, from the floor here. Um, just, I mean, obviously not too many people are going to be, you know, producing this particular, I think it was probably like an IKEA model that I that I modeled. Um, but the possibilities of being able to do this now in Onshape is really what we're talking about here. Jay, this is one of your favorites, right? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah I, I, we, I, you want me to go to wax philosophic about this thing? 
Yeah, for a minute. Yeah. I mean, look, if you guys look at the light source itself, look at the bulb, uh, and what you see is what you would expect to see. You know, your eye is essentially, your iris is contracting. The light is basically reflecting off of every single surface on the inside of that light housing. However, because of the different material properties of the table and the marble base, uh, you can, like, if you look at the table, it has diffused that bright light enough that you can see where the bulb is, in this case, the emitter. Um, and then follow that contour of the inside of the lamp housing up into the base of the light where it's marble, and you can see that it's much sharper. So it's the same light source, the same housing, same model components around the light source, but we get two totally different effects based on the material properties that it is shining on or reflecting off of. It's just amazing. And it's a simple model. And if you saw this in the assembly, uh, it's not very exciting. <laughs> yeah. Put it bring in here and all bets are off. Incredible. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is a um, pretty close up of a turbine mechanism from a wristwatch. And again, this is kind of thinking like a bit like the photographer. There's some composition, there's some really you know interesting angles that you can use here. Um, this material is a gold, a glossy gold material, but it contains again fingerprints. And none of these edges are, sh um, are rounded in on shape. All of this is modeled in the actual um, photo. Part, uh, the, part of the, the material the, definition. It's part of the material definition. You just said, give me a whatever 0.1 millimeter radius on this, and boom, there it is. The <laughs> emerald on here, um, there's a paint finish on here, showing some brush strokes. That's uh, nuts. It's nuts, yeah. <laughs> Here's the uh, the Ghost Raptor uh, BattleBot again. Uh, there's a lot going on in this, especially a lot of decals and stickers. Um, so you, there's different techniques you can use for this. And I showed one of them on the back of the screen of the camera, but I used a different technique here that I'm gonna go into. Um, one of the interesting things is you can use different projections to do like spherical or, or, or planar or cylindrical or whatever kind of projections to make sure that the image um, is mapping kind of the image onto the surfaces. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. None, yeah. You might not have a convenient flat surface in in the X right. Y plane or something as this one is. And finally, this is a really exciting one for me because this was created only a couple of days ago um, by a customer for Avidbots, and you know, Ian kindly allowed me to show it to you because this is an incredibly incredibly successful image. Um, he hasn't been using this long because nobody has, right? We've just released it. Uh, but if you look at this, this fits basically every one of the tips and tricks that Jay and I have been mulling over. The environment is great. The environment is perfect. It's got the appropriate depth of field. You can see the foreground is fuzzy, the background's fuzzy, but the middle ground where the product is, is in focus. The, the materials look great. The lighting looks great. I don't know, it, it's, it, this is a compelling image. Now imagine if you tried to set this up as a physical photo shoot, you know, to at your local shopping mall, it's going to be a, a big pain, right, to, to, to organize. We can create, you know, as many angles and, and photos now as we like uh, at this quality. Um, you know, it, it's a, it really is a game changer. Okay, um, so we have some, uh... Go ahead. I was just going to say we have. So I've been trying to answer as many questions as possible in the uh, in the chat window. Um, okay. Yeah. If up... there's any other burning ones, um, then happy to try and we we've nearly well, hit was... up against the end of the hour. But yeah. Yeah. There was one. I mean, I'm not sure you have access to it, but I, I thought it was part of our deck. Um, it, it was that the exhaust of someone was asking, can we do heat treatment on on metals? And, and the answer is yes. Um, Greg had a I've seen it. I just it's not part of this deck. Uh, but but yeah, you can, you can definitely add heat treatment effects to to metals themselves, like bluing of a pipe, for example. Yeah, if you if you think back to the dirt the uh, the, the motocross bike that I showed yeah. before, I had a, a subtle effect of that on. I mean, you could ramp that up and really make it blue, um, and I had a pretty low setting um, for that. Uh, somebody asked, uh, David uh, asked, where's the scenes material folder? Because I was talking earlier about saving materials. You don't really, I mean, it, what you do is when you apply a material to an object, that material is then saved down in a folder when you're in the, in, uh, not the environment, when you're in the library 
uh, you'll have the library materials, and then below there, there is a folder called scene materials. Uh, in fact, it's a, a tip and trick. Um, if you, let's say I had like five parts that were anodized aluminum, if you drag from the, the uh, V material library, I drag out anodized aluminum five times and apply it to those five objects, I'm gonna have five instances down in the scene materials folder, which makes it difficult later to go in and tweak everything universally. So a technique that I've developed was to apply the anodized aluminum once, apply it to that object, then immediately open up the scene materials folder, and then from then on in, all of the parts that are the same anodized aluminum, I just drag that material out of the scene materials folder and drop it on the parts. That way, you, you know, go to that one place, make changes to the material, it's stored down there. Uh, I'm, I can see, AJ, I've got a couple of questions I can see here, and, and the last one I'm yeah. looking at is, can you control the perspective angle, like tweaking it so it's exaggerated, for example? Absolutely, yes, you know, and that's in the lens control. And um, you can actually do it in a subtle way because most lenses have imperfections. It's like the barrel um, imperfections. So you get a little bit of fisheyeness in the corners of even very expensive lenses. So most software like Photoshop has compensations for those things. But in reality, real lenses have imperfections in the corner. Now, you can take that to an extreme. And if you want to do a fully spherical mapping, a full fisheye output, uh, you can. Um, so you've got full control over that. Yeah. And there was one other question about the sticker in the Ghost Raptor um, or the Guard Dog sticker. And I used, depending on the sticker and the location of the sticker, I use different UV projection methods. Um, there are some ones that are appropriate for a plane or a sphere or a cylinder, and then there are other ones that you know, tend to wrap, right, um, and project. Um, in fact, a really, really good example of this is if you're trying to put carbon fiber on some kind of organic shape, uh, like a good tube you know, bottom of a bicycle, right, you know, where all the tubes are coming together and around the bottom bracket. Um, there's kind of three directions, and there's a thing called a triplanar projection, uh, which tries to average out where the three planes meet as it wraps around, and it, it's really, really good. Um, so yes, like nearly everything in here, there are a lot of controls over just about everything. Uh, I'm seeing you that. Uh... I, I'm, I'm just going to. I think we can close it out now. Um, there are a lot of questions in here, obviously, that we will um, not be able to get to in the next 30 seconds. Um, but we can look at them. We know who's been asked of them. We'll um, we'll make the effort to to answer back to you. Um, and please stay in touch with us on the forums and all the other methods that you that you already do. Thank you again for your time. And uh, we look forward to these uh, the images and the compelling images that you're going to be able to create in the new Onshape Render Studio. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.